good morning and welcome to the 13th meeting of the committee in 2015. Uh, if you wish to use tablet devices or mobile phones during the meeting, please switch them to flight mode as they may otherwise affect the broadcasting system. Some committee members uh, may consult uh, tablet devices during the course of the meeting as we provide papers in a digital format. Uh, we have received apologies from Cara Hilton today. Um, our first agenda item today is to agree to take agenda item three in private. Are we all agreed? agreed. Yes, thank you. Uh, we now move on to agenda item two. Um, Claire Adamson. Um, yes, um, I'd like to declare an interest before we move into this um, agenda item as myself and my husband are members of um, Strathclyde Pension Fund. Thank you. Any other declarations? Willie Coffey, please. Convener, I would like to declare an interest. I'm also a member of the Strathclyde Pension Fund. Alec Rowley, please. Convener, I'm a member of the Fife Pension Fund. And John Wilson, please. Convener, I think I'm a member of a go local government pension fund, but I'm not exactly sure, but my wife is a member of Strathclyde Pension Fund. Thank you uh, for those declarations. Um, the second item is uh, an oral evidence session with two panels of witnesses on our mainstream consideration of the budget strategy phase 2016-17. Uh, in this session, we'll investigate further an issue we identified in our report to the Finance Committee last December on the 2015-16 budget. That is on the role of local government pension funds investing in the delivery of local capital infrastructure. Um, so I'd like to start by welcoming our first panel of witnesses, who are Chad Daughtry, uh, Director of Policy at the Scottish Public Pensions Agency, Barry White, Chief Executive of the Scottish Futures Trust, Dave Watson, Scottish organiser with Unison Scotland, and Peter Morris of the Greater Manchester Pension Fund and Head of Pension Policy at Thameside Metropolitan Borough Council, at which point I'll declare a, uh, an interest as a member of Unison as well. Uh, before we move on to the questions, uh, do any of the witnesses wish to make any brief re opening remarks? No? In which case, we'll move straight, straight on. Um, I wonder if you could uh, give us an indication uh, of the overall investment strategies of local government pension funds um, and how uh, investment uh, locally in, in capital infrastructure fits into that situation. Uh, Mr Morris, would you like to start off, please? Um, m m a lot of pension funds will invest about 60% to two thirds of their of their money in, 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 in companies, and probably up to a third in, 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 in loans and, 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 and bonds. And generally speaking, most pension funds in, in, in invest a relatively small proportion of their of their money in private equity and infrastructure. Um, and ten percent is probably uh, an upper limit in property. Uh, we, we, we are very much. Uh, invested along those lines. Um, one, one, one of the reasons is our, our pension scheme, the LGPS, is based on an assumption by the government that it will deliver 3% real returns. And one of the few ways in the current environment where you can get a 3% real return is if you, if you expect equities are going to deliver good returns going forward. At the moment, when you've got bonds delivering negative real returns, it's really, really difficult to, to, to get to anywhere near that three percent. So, so what what do we do? We we are at uh, the more rare end of the spectrum in terms of our local investments, um, and it, and it's been growing over time. Uh, our predecessor fund uh, started with a little bit of private equity investment in the in the nineteen eighties. Uh, Thameside took responsibility for the fund in, in, in 1987, and pretty soon thereafter, it started to try and invest locally uh, in, in, in property development situations. And, 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 and more recently, uh, we, we, we've expanded uh, quite a bit our, our local investment capability, capacity, and, and, and the investments that we're making. So, so in, in, my, uh, in my note, you, you'll have seen that uh, the Greater Manchester Property Venture Fund, which is very much as its name suggests, investing property development opportunities, we can have invest up to 3% of the fund in that activity. Um, our investment in housing, which is homes for sale and market rent, has uh, attracted a lot of interest. So we're, we're in the first stage of, of, of building 240 homes there. Um, we have um, 
a, a local uh, impact portfolio, which again can be sort of investing up to 150 million. So we, we've got a variety of means in which we invest locally, but we, we invest locally on, on two, two premises. One, it's got to deliver commercial returns, and secondly, it, it's got to have some add-on benefits to the area. I'll pause there. Thank you very much. Mr Daughtry, do you want to talk um, about yeah, the um, Scottish perspective? The, the Scottish Government doesn't actually hold records on exactly where each of the 11 pension funds invest their money. Um, it might help the committee, and I think I've referred to this in the paper, to know that there are now new governance arrangements in place, which just came into effect on the 1st of April, which um, require there to be a scheme advisory board. The first meeting of that board is tomorrow. Um, and it's going to look at uh, a series of issues around about its work plan. One of those, I think, is going to be on the transparency of where where in, um, funds are investing their money. But at the moment, the Scottish Government doesn't have a central view of where that money is invested. Uh, thank you. Mr White, do the Scottish Futures Trust uh, have a view on all of this, and could you benefit from pension funds um, investing in local infrastructure? Um, <clears throat> I think Scottish infrastructure and the Scottish economy could benefit from um, a more active investment style from, from pension funds. Uh, and I think the paper from Manchester, I think, summed it up in that it's not an either-or question in terms of commercial returns. I think it is a case of saying, can you get that with a, a proportion of the fund, can you get a double bottom line of both a commercial return and satisfy um, some local investment uh, opportunities as well. Um, and I think the areas, and, and, and there was a paper from Unison on housing, I think areas like housing in particular are one of the areas where housing supply with additional investment could be a good opportunity both for pension funds and actually to help the wider economy. I think there are other areas beyond that, but I think um, the uh, opportunity is certainly there. I think, rightly, the Manchester Pension Fund or Greater Manchester Pension Fund paper highlights some of the risks in that, and that there's a capacity and capability point in terms of actually moving from a to more active management of investments rather than doing it through third parties. If you're doing it more hands-on yourself, both the governance and the capacity within the team probably needs to be slightly different than it currently is. How different? Um, I just think if you're going to start making investment decisions about investing locally, you do need more hands-on expertise. If you look at something like the um, University Superannuation Scheme, um, which is headquartered in London, covering all of the UK's universities, um, they have an infrastructure investment team in-house, and through that team um, have bought stakes in uh, the air traffic control, or NATS, the air traffic service, Heathrow Airport, and some other investments. But they then put people onto the boards of some of those companies as well. And likewise, with some of the big Canadian pension funds, their style very much is to take direct investments um, rather than go through third-party funds, but then to actively help manage those investments as well. So I think overall, and, and, and I think, again, the Manchester paper brings this out, if you are going to start assessing, for instance, a property transaction or a housing transaction, you do need to have a more hands-on approach than outsourcing a management to a fund where you're actually monitoring the performance of the fund, um, I think there's bigger decisions to be made when you're investing locally. Thank you. Mr Watson, do you have anything to add? Yes. Um, I mean, I suppose our interests um, came apart as a result of the new um, governance arrangement that Chad has just mentioned, but also obviously in negotiating the new pension scheme uh, that comes into force this month. Um, when we saw, for the probably first time, uh, the, an aggregate of where the money was currently being invested in Scotland, and uh, we did notice that, that almost half the investment at that time uh, was in overseas equities, and another quarter was in UK equities, and very little in, in, in local infrastructure investment. Now, obviously, our members want a return on the investment to pay their pensions. That, that's my primary job as a lead negotiator uh, for the pension scheme. Um, but they'd prefer that investment, obviously, to be in things which are, are useful for them and, and, their, and, and their members. Uh, and, uh, and also a concern that equity investments was uh, costing a lot of money in hidden management costs, and we've commissioned quite a lot of work in this area. So it was another driver to look at a different 
different uh, uh, methods of, uh, of looking at that. As one member put it to me at the meeting, my pension fund invests in Tokyo Underground but doesn't invest in the Clockwork Orange that I go to work in every day. Uh, that's maybe a simplistic description of it, but it reflects, I think, a, a reasonable local view. So that's why uh, I, in conjunction with the Scottish Association of uh, uh, Housing, Fed Housing Federation, um, got together and thought, well, let's have a look at housing as an example of this, and you've got the paper th uh, there um, to, to look at. But I don't think it's just housing. I think we, we wrote the paper on housing really to sort of start to stimulate a discussion around the, this area, uh, and I think it did do that to a degree. Um, and I think now is the time to take that forward with the new governance arrangements. I think there are con some constraints which I'm sure you'll want to, to explore, and I'll happily cover those uh, in further questions. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr Morris, if I could return to you, because we've heard that um, local investment, particularly in areas like housing, uh, may uh, require more hands-on support uh, within the fund to make sure um, that the, uh, the investment is managed wisely. Has that been the Manchester experience? And if so, could you give us an example of what additional resource has been required uh, to ensure the delivery of, of these infrastructure projects? Right. Yeah. Our, our local investments and property team currently has eight people in it and they're looking after a very small proportion of our fund which will grow up to, to be up to 5% of fund value. The, the, the other 95% is looked after by a team which has got one more member of staff in it. Nine versus eight? Yeah. And, 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 and we have consciously separated out the local investment team. Obviously there's, a, there's an overlap at, at, at times, if a potential big transaction comes our way, I, 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 either way that is, but, but the, 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 the scale of the demands of local investment, or, or from our perspective, or, 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 or much greater than, than looking after other assets. And the reason for that is because we're more involved. Um, can, can I ask you, though, in terms of the nine who are dealing with the other stuff, um, how much money? Um, is spent on fund managers to deal with those other investments and are there any fund managers involved um, in the delivery of the local investment? Um, for our property venture fund we have an external manager uh, sourcing, arranging, managing and, and, and seeing through the development albeit it still involves uh, more of, of, of our involvement than it does with anything we do on, 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 on the main fund side. And, and of course the reason why we do that is we think we get reward from it. Um, but but <coughs> if, 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 if we get involved in a, a, a relatively uh, significant transaction, um, generally speaking it involves taking on board representation on the vehicles in, in, in which are managing the investment. Um, we, we either do the appraisal or, generally speaking, challenge the appraisal much more than we would do in any other situation. And, and we will do, so on the housing, for example, we do for the joint venture vehicle, we do the accounting, we do the administration of the vehicle, again, something which fits within the activities which we do. I, 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 I can give more examples of this if you like. But but so what, what I'm trying to get my head around is, obviously, you've got eight folk dealing with the local investment, nine folk with all of the other stuff. But from, from my experience, you know, although you've got a small team of folk dealing with the, the business, the day-to-day -day business of the pension fund, often there is a huge amount of outsourcing and payment to others to deal with the aspects of that fund. So while you may have eight folk dealing with the, the local investment, nine folk dealing with the other stuff, it may well be that the costs of overall of dealing with the other stuff is much greater because you're using external sources to deal with a lot of that work. If, if, That's what I'm trying to get right, my head right. around. So, so, so the, the, the illustration I will give then is where we're investing in, in equities and, 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 and bonds, the, 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 the cost of that will be, um, it, in, in terms of manager fees, it will be appreciably less than 0.2%. Where, where, where we are investing in things like uh, private equity, um, the, 
the, the sums that go in management there may well be sort of up to 5%, depending on the success of the fund. The, 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 the local investments are going to be more towards the costs associated with private equity infrastructure funds than what they are with investing in companies and bonds. A percentage, have you got any idea? Um, Well, maybe let you think about no, it and come, let me, let me, and let me come back to, to that. John Wilson, please. Thank you, Convener. Good morning. Uh, just to go back to Mr Todry's uh, opening comments in terms of the answer to yourself, Convener. The, just to, the Local Government Pension Scheme Advisory Board uh, was supposed to be established under the new rules that came into effect on the 1st of April. Uh, what I picked up from what you said is the first meeting of that board will take place tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, as far as I'm aware, there is no public announcement being made about who the board members are. Uh, could you give an indication of who will make up the board, uh, where they come from, yeah. and the experience they have? Um, I don't have a list of all the members to hand, uh, but it will be published on our website. It should already actually be there. Um, SPPA's website. The Scheme Advisory Board is bipartite, so it's got employer and it's got a member or employee representatives. The Scottish Government is represented there by the SPPA with observer capacity, so it's, it's run effectively by employers and members. The, the member representatives are union nominated. And the balance in terms of the board? Because, as I said, th this isn't public information at the present moment, and I was quite surprised when you announced it. Because uh, even checking yesterday afternoon to find out who, if there had been an announcement, the, the only thing that's on the Scottish Government website is a, uh, there are uh, discussions taking place about the appointment of the board, but the, board, uh, the names of those on the, the board hadn't been made public. And it's just to try and get a balance, is it? No, 40-40 with Scottish Government representation. 20%. No, it's, it's, it's um, pretty much even representation between employers and, and they're represented by elected members and um, members who are represented by trade unions. The Scottish Government doesn't have a, a formal seat at the table. We are there with an observer status. Other people I can attend as well. Uh, advisors can come along to meetings as well. I was also interested in the comment that you made about the government not holding any information in relation to where the current pension investments are taking place. And there's been no analysis done on that. And I thank Mr Watson uh, and Unison's work that they've done on uh, analysing where the investments are currently taking place. But would you envisage that one of the major tasks of the new board, advisory board, would be to find out where local government pension funds are being invested uh, and how, and before you actually have that information, because you need that information to know whether or not you can advise the pension funds on whether or not the, the, the type of investments that are taking place uh, would be seen or deemed as appropriate by the advisory board. Um, I, I suppose I'd answer that in two ways. That it's perhaps not a major task of the Scheme Advisory Board that the Scheme Advisory Board is obviously going to have to look at a number of things and its predecessor, which was called SLOGPAG, which is the Scottish Local Government Pensions Advisory Group, agreed a draft work plan or effectively to-do list. It's not quite yet a work plan, so tomorrow's meeting will start to turn that into a work plan. Uh, and, and I think I've already indicated that one of the areas that has to be looked at is the transparency of where investments from the various funds are going. The Scottish Government has taken the view that um, we set out the framework within which the scheme operates. Um, there are 11 funds and they've got delegated responsibility to manage within those regulations. Um, but absolutely, the Scheme Advisory Board will want to know where monies are being put. And th this raises the other issue about, that Mr Watson raised about you know, pension funds uh, Strathclyde Pension Fund investing in the Tokyo uh, rail network uh, at the same time, 
failing to invest in local traffic and infrastructure or transport infrastructure uh, in, in and around Strathclyde. Uh, the issue would be, would the advisory board be, and, and I'm trying to preempt the first meeting, uh, Mr. Dodgery, but in terms of the issue, uh, would the advisory board be looking to uh, give clearer direction to the pension fund investments, bearing in mind the fiduciary duties that will apply to these pension funds, uh, but clearer direction in terms of the possibility of investing in infrastructure projects within their own region or within Scotland? But, I, I mean, I think, first of all, Scottish ministers have been very clear about this. They, they can see the advantages of investment being made um, in infrastructure, whether it's the local government pension scheme or, or any other pension scheme. Um, but yes, the Scheme Advisory Board will need to, to consider, based on the information it gets on where the, the money is going, and, and effectively do something like what the committee is doing here, look at examples of, of where, where things have worked well and, and case studies about where opportunities might be taken. I've mentioned Mr Watson a couple of times. I wonder if Mr Watson would like to respond to the Surprisingly, he'd love to, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, there are, there are, it's, it's bipartite, as Chad says, um, and, and a rotating chair. So there's seven councillors and seven trade union reps on the, on the new scheme advisory board. Uh, COS will provide the employer side secretary at and I'm the trade union side uh, secretary to new board. The paper that we're jointly taking to the board meet, first board meeting tomorrow includes a, a work plan for the for, for the new scheme advisory board and high up on that 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 work plan is to address both the transparency of, of information in relation to investments, but also consistency. Uh, at the moment, um, there are really only two ways that, that people can look at how this information is, is brought together on a Scottish-wide basis. One, it's done at the time of valuation, so the GAD in the main, the Government Actuary Department, when for the negotiations on the new scheme and each for the trying to valuations, tend to pull together that data so you get a nice chart and you can see where it goes, but all, that's always a little bit out of date, in, in fairness. Uh, and the second way of doing it, of course, is freedom of information requests, uh, which are done uh, by ourselves and by journalists and others. Uh, frankly, it's not the best way to uh, to, to pull together uh, information on on what is you know 26, 27 billion pounds worth of investment. It's a huge driver in the, or should be a huge driver in the Scottish economy. Uh, and therefore, I think you know we I think there's a broad understanding we need to explore ways of having some consistency and transparency so everyone can see where that money is being invested and then I think once you've got that you then start to have a, a discussion about what sort of advice and guidance is necessary to to shift the balance of, uh, of investment to those areas that both employers and, and the trade unions would wish to see it go to. Um, yes I, I think we should be very careful I don't think we should criticise um, pension funds for investing in the Tokyo subway or do, you know let's not pick on just the Tokyo subway if, if that's a good investment I think that's a perfectly valid thing for pension funds to do I think it's just about a mix in a portfolio and I think allocating part of their fund for local investment but managing that carefully would be a good thing to see happening but I don't think we should be drawn in to saying investing in the Tokyo pension if that's a good investment and helping the fund be successful I think it's really important I think the transparency point, one of the great challenges in transparency is there's lots of infrastructure funds with lots of local government pension fund money in it. Those infrastructure funds are quite reluctant to declare who's invested in them because that's their customer base and they don't want other infrastructure funds tapping up their customer base. So we know, for instance, in Dumfries and Galloway, a, a hospital, the New Royal Infirmary, which is an NPD project, some of the sub-debt for that project was put in by Aberdeen Asset Management, which is their infrastructure fund. Uh, and actually, from the papers, Strathclyde have said they're one of the investors in that fund. We would not necessarily have visibility of that um, as part of the procurement team working with the health board for that project. And I'm delighted they are part of it, but equally, the Aberdeen Asset Management Fund will invest all across the UK and even abroad. So, so from that point of view, getting absolute transparency is, is, is more difficult. But I think what Manchester's done very well is saying up to a certain limit of our fund, we will look to do some local stuff, I think it's 5%, uh, but manage that really carefully. 
And I think that added transparency and added focus is a really helpful aspect. John? I thank Mr White for that response, and I think NPD is a debate for another day, as you'll note from my parliamentary, recent parliamentary questions on the returns uh, in terms of some of the funding of NPD projects. But in relation to the existing 11 local government pension funds that exist in Scotland, how many of those pension funds are actually investing in local infrastructure or Scottish-wide infrastructure? Uh, because that, I think that's the, the reason for the debate, is to try and find out how best we can utilise those resources that are sitting there. And I think the Toku Underground is a good example to highlight that while the underground system in Glasgow uh, needs major investment, uh, public what would be perceived as... The, as uh, Mr Watson said, Scottish trade union members' money is being used to invest in improving transport structures in uh, Japan, but uh, there seems to be a reluctance to use that funding to invest in infrastructure projects uh, and transport projects in Scotland. And non-trade union members yeah, as sorry, well. Sorry. Um, uh, <laughs> Anyone got an answer to how many pension funds are actually? Mr White? I, I, I don't can't specifically answer that question. I struggle, as I understand it, the uh, underground in Glasgow is publicly owned, and therefore the reason pension funds will invest in Tokyo Subway, for instance, will be because somehow there's a private element of finance going into that. So actually, investment into the underground in Glasgow is a question of two things – public powers of borrowing, given that it's a public asset, and how you repay that investment. So either the fares have to go up or somebody else has to pick up the tab for the borrowing. So, so even if any of the pension funds here today wanted to invest in the, in, in, in the underground Glasgow, as currently structured, they couldn't unless the Scottish Government or um, uh, Glasgow City Council were to issue bonds to invest in it but then that would be a sort of government-backed bond or a, 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 a municipal bond uh, rather than um, an infrastructure-backed sort of investment. So I, th I think because of the public nature of much of our infrastructure in Scotland, there are limited opportunities for uh, pension funds to invest directly into a lot of our transport infrastructure, as an example. Right. Can we... Can we right. Before we get sidetracked here. Does anyone have the answer to the original question uh, about how many pension funds in Scotland are actually investing uh, in local infrastructure? No. Okay. On you go, On you go. Thank you. It's interesting in terms of the example you gave, Mr White, in terms of public versus private investment. Uh, and part of the dilemma I think that we may be facing is how do we square the circle in terms of ensuring that the pension funds can be used for public projects. Because I, I look at the recent example in the last decade, or you no, know, it's more than a decade now, uh, but in terms of the investment that took place in the, the building of new schools throughout Scotland by local authorities, uh, and the investment regime that was used in those circumstances did not involve public money, it involved public-private partnerships and the PFI uh, example was used in PPP to actually deliver those skills. But how do we get to a position where we can use those pension funds or utilise those pension funds to deliver public projects? Because if you're saying that the difference is that Tokyo is a private rail network and yet the Glasgow subway is publicly owned, how do we get that situation where we can utilise what may be uh, useful investment if you're saying that we can, that it's difficult because of the dilemma between public versus private investment? Mr White, do you want to go first, please? Yeah, I, I suppose there's a couple of quick answers to that. Um, there's a bit about borrowing powers in the Smith Commission where the Scottish Government could issue bonds and pension funds could buy those bonds. So I think that's one part. Um, I think within the complex classification rules, the, one of the only ways to get investment, um, into, pension fund investment into public infrastructure is through 
NPD, PPP type structures with using project finance, and that's that's what the rules and the accounting rules say you can do. And I would therefore say the areas to think about for pension fund investment are ones where there's some other form of income stream other than coming from the government itself. And that's why housing, I think, is a particularly attractive example because you've got tenants paying rent. I think energy efficiency, I think offshore wind. These are big areas requiring private investment um, rather than uh, that are not publicly owned assets. And I think, therefore, that the, uh, or, or commercial property in our big cities um, could all be very good uh, sources of or, or attractive opportunities for pension funds to invest in if they had that in increased local focus. I think in terms of getting pension fund money into public assets, such as schools, the only way that can practically happen under the current sort of accounting rules is through a, a project finance PPP or NPD type structure. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr Daughtry, if I could turn to, to you, um, do you have any idea at this moment in time what percentage of investment uh, of pension fund money is invested in Scotland? Local government pension scheme? Yes. No, I, th I think I said that earlier on. The Scottish government doesn't hold that. And, I mean, and, Dave and Watson's helpfully given an estimate that's been done uh, work for, on behalf of Unison, but we don't have formal records on that. In terms of the work of the new group, is that one of the things that they will be looking at as part of their work programme? Yes, transparency of investments in general. So that would include into, in, into infrastructure, but also other areas. Mr Watson, do you want to put your <coughs> estimate on the record, please? Uh, I, there's no way of telling us from Scotland because you know, the nature of the, the UK one in the last figures we have was about a quarter. Uh, in UK, of the money was going UK, UK equities. Uh, but there's no way of breaking that down between Scotland and the rest of the UK. Thank you. Alec Rowley, please. Good morning. A lot of this seems quite, quite complex, and um, I've always found when you speak to finance people in local government or whatever, you know, there's a lot of reasons why you can't do something. And I suppose what I'm trying to bring it back to is that if there is a political directive that says, and let's take, for example, housing, because housing, housing we, we do have a, a housing crisis in Scotland. And so at a government level, at a local government level, there's a political directive that says we need to build houses, we need to build 50,000 houses over the next four or five years, and we need to fund that. Um, I suppose my question is, what are the barriers and how do we break those barriers down? And rather starting from a point of view of, you know, there's, 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 there's like, I mean, it's like the Tokyo, Tokyo Express, you, you say, if it's a good investment, but that depends on how you measure good, I suppose, um, because there is profit. And if it was housing, there would be the profit that comes from guaranteed rents. Personally, I would say that, that we need to see council housing being built so that you're guaranteed the rents, there's housing benefit there, so we know the return might perhaps not be as big as the Tokyo Express, but there is still a return. But the, the good of the social good uh, for the communities and for housing. So rather than, than trying to go around all these different complex classification rules that are there, if there's a political directive that says we want to invest in that, how do we how do we go about that? What's the barriers? And should that not be our starting point rather than looking at all the complexities? Let's go to Mr Morris first because you seem to have managed to break down some of the barriers and invest in some housing. Yep. I, think, I think the starting point is in our fund, a 1% investment return is worth 8% of the total pay bill. And what, what as has been said earlier and, 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 and says in my paper, the, to, to, to do local investment, you've got to satisfy the twin aims, the twin aims of commercial returns, as well as supporting the area. I, 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 I'll, I'll talk through briefly the illustration, if that's okay, the illustration that we've got with Manchester. Um, Manchester's just like any other area of the country. There's a lot, there's a big shortage of houses. Um, we did not go down the social housing route with Manchester because we didn't think that was capable of delivering a viable return to us. So our, our, our pilot is 240 homes. Um, and the proportion that was for sale and the proportion that for rent 
was, 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 was driven by the target return that we were seeking. So in, in, if, 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 if there's a little bit more risk attached with the sale option because you don't know how much you're going to get and you don't know how quickly you're going to sell them. But, but, the, but the, the, the sale option produces um, a higher rate of return than the rental option. So in, 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 in terms of the numbers, for us to get a viable return, it had to either be sale or, 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 or market rent. Um, we've, we've got um, a mixed range of sites. So the reality is um, some of those sites will have a very, very high land value per plot. Some of those sites might well have a negative land value per plot. In terms of our appraisal, we appraised the five sites together and the return was based on all the five sites added up. If you've got a negative land value on a site, you know, literally you've got to give somebody some money for them to build to make, to, to, to make it work. So, so, so one of the good things about what we did, it meant housing took place earlier than would have otherwise been the case and more of it took place. So, so the expensive site, Manchester could have sold that site to a private developer and the private developer would have built homes on that site. But putting a mixed range of sites together enabled the aggregate to deliver a satisfactory return for us and a satisfactory return for Manchester and Manchester reaps the benefits of more rates, it reaps the benefit of new homes bonus and, 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 and all that goes with it. The way the deal's structured is, 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 is in effect from our perspective for a long time, it's a bond, it's, it's a fixed interest type return. And at the end of, of, of 21 years, that then we will get any, any, any uh, equity type returns that flow from it. There, there are four or five parties which are quite important to make this work well. Um, we've obviously got to get on well with the city council we need uh, good project management and good technical skills. We need a good builder. We as a pension fund don't want to be a direct landlord, so you want, in effect, a tenant who's going to act as landlord for, for, for all the other properties. And not only are they a tenant, they're responsible for the property management. So, so they will calculate what rent they think they can get, and then they'll knock off their void risk, their repair and maintenance risk, their bad debt risk, and that gives, in effect, a rent to us. The attractions of the rent is the rent is linked to inflation going forward. And it's, it's, it's a 21-year lease. So what you've got is 240 homes, cost us 26 million. There was the Manchester land value, which, which was uh, obviously um, a reasonable sum, um, in aggregate, and, and, and that's the way profits are shared, land value relative to, to our, our investment. So, so the sale prices obviously varied, depending on location, just like they would anywhere else. The houses that we built are very, very similar, on, in fact, virtually the same on most locations. Those pr yeah, the very sure. beginning, uh, I think you said that there was more risk um, in dealing with the houses for sale than there were the houses for rent. Am I correct in that? What, yeah, what, what, what I was attempting to say there, I didn't say it sufficiently clearly, the, the rented properties, we, we, we have one tenant which is responsible. It's, it's a, a big registered social landlord which is responsible for the lettings of the 120 properties and making sure everything works. So, so, so you know that that income is guaranteed and you know it's going to move over the next 20 years. What you do in your financial model, you make assumptions on the number of homes that you'll sell and the price that you sell them for. Fortunately, the, the, the way things are going, the housing market is, is, is working in our favour. So we're selling quicker and prices are higher than we expected. And, and, and that's something which will add to the, uh, improve the, uh, the financial returns from the project. OK. Um, going back to... Mr. Rowley's original question. Mr. Watson? Yeah, I'm, I'm, 
obviously, I, you'd not be surprised, I probably wouldn't agree with Barry on the investing in PPP schemes, but I do agree with him that uh, that yeah, we're not saying don't invest in the Tokyo Underground or anybody else. Uh, obviously, it's, it's a balance. We just think the balance has got a bit out of skew when half the money's going going abroad. I think the key point about a good investment for, for, for pension funds, the key word here is investment. This is not free money. It has to have a rate of return to it. Uh, and therefore, um, investment in things that have a revenue stream like housing, like transport, like energy. Local, we're very keen on lo local authorities getting much more involved in local energy generation. These things have a revenue to them, so they make themselves more suitable for, um, for pension-type investment. You, Alec asked about the, the barriers. I think the, there are a number. One is I think the, there is inevitably a small-c conservatism about pension funds generally and local authority pension funds are no different than anybody else. Yeah, we've always done it this way. We know we know about some things. We're not so sure about other things. That's very closely linked to the issue of expertise. Uh, again, pension funds know and understand equity investment. Um, they understand commercial property investment pretty well as well. A lot of experience there. When you talk to pension funds, both in the public and the private sector, and I deal with both, um, very often they say, we don't really understand social housing and, uh, and you know, we don't have the expertise and we're a bit nervous about getting involved in that area, you know, to which my answer is, well, get the expertise. Um, my view, probably one of the best managed pension funds in the UK is West Yorkshire, who has an almost entirely in-house team uh, and lots of expertise acro across the board. I think you can develop that expertise uh, to build in this area. The other barrier tends to be um, a, a view of fiduciary duty. Um, which I, uh, I, again, a fairly conservative view of fiduciary duty. Uh, there haven't been many legal cases, and probably the worst one is is the Scargill against the Cowan case, which is pretty infamous, but as, as, as we lawyers say, bad cases make bad law, uh, and that really was a bad case for bad law. Um, I think there's been um, some more helpful view. Um, there's a, the Local Government Association England Commission's Council Opinion on Fiduciary Duty. It's a public document now, and I think... That's quite a helpful description of how pension funds can be a bit more imaginative and not be too constrained by fiduciary duty. You've got to invest in the interest of the funds. That doesn't mean you can't do a range of other things there. Uh, and I think the, perhaps the final barrier is that I don't think it's been a problem so far, but there are obviously limits to the type of investment under the, in the investment regulations 2010. And I think one of the things we'll want to look at in the scheme advisory board uh, is whether there needs to be more flexibility in those investment regulations to give um, uh, um, pension funds the ability to be able to invest uh, with the current constraints and I think give some advice and guidance on issues like fiduciary duty as well. Mr White, please. I think housing is a really good example to, to answer the question. Um, I think there's a number of ways we could increase housing supply quickly, and I don't actually think pension funds taking the lead in that is going to help in the short term because I don't think they're geared up to do that at the moment. Um, I think um, with the Smith Commission giving increased borrowing powers, I don't quite know where, where the schedule of increased borrowing power sits, but it could be very possible for the government to borrow money and using public land and other land, either in joint venture with private sector, to build housing at scale with a view to selling that to a pension fund-led company at some stage in the future. So actually, rather than waiting for the pension funds to develop the capability, develop a product that could be sold to pension funds. So actually, um, and that could be done on a rolling basis, so you know, more, more could be done. But one of the things that stops that at the moment is the limited borrowing powers the Scottish Government has. Um, the current rate of borrow or cost of borrowing for Scottish Government or is about 2.4 per cent or 2.5 per cent over about 20 years. So actually, in terms of making it viable, mid-market rent housing could be done on a very viable basis at the moment at that sort of um, cost of finance. If you're then selling that to a pension fund, their interest would be probably in having a higher rate of return than, than perhaps that 2.4 per cent because that represents a, a sovereign sort of cost of borrowing but nevertheless, I think it could still be viable. What you may have to do is have a mix of, and it's probably quite a good thing anyway, to have a mix of private rent and mid-market rent and that sort of development to, to, to make it all stack up financially. So I think there are things to increase housing supply, but, but housing in many ways is, is you, know, you, you said some of the sort of discussions quite complex. Housing is probably one of the most simple things. There's the cost of land, the cost of building the house, and the cost of finance. Those are the variables on one side, and there's the rent is, or, or sale is the, in, is the income on the other side. And I think 
um, well, the government has an advantage and it's got a very low cost to finance and therefore one of the things we've done in the National Housing Trust is use local authority borrowing cost to finance to make mid-market rent viable without any direct subsidy. So that shows it can be done and actually with wider borrowing powers more could happen in, in, in that field. Um, it's probably just worth highlighting and, and, and um, I'm neither advocating government borrowing or PPP or any preference for either, but within the NPD programme, 1.8 billion of projects have reached financial clues so far. Almost half the finance for that has come from pension funds and insurance companies. So there is people investing institutional money into Scotland right now. A lot of that has come from out with Scotland uh, in terms of where the funds are headquartered, where the actual uh, pension funds invest in that, it's very hard to trace back to exactly who invests in these funds. But I, I think that makes a point for me in some ways. If you have the right product, the pension funds will step up and put money in. And I think in housing, part of the challenge we have is creating that product for them to invest in. Mr. Daughtry. <clears throat> yeah, I'm, I don't have a huge amount to add, I'm afraid. Um, investment specialities are not my area of expertise. My agency looks after the legislative framework and the design of five pension schemes. The local government pension scheme is one of those um, and make sure that the regulations are looked after, the legislation is looked after. Um, but obviously to echo what colleagues have been, have been saying just now and also just to remind the committee without over, over stressing this that there, there is this fiduciary duty and yes there is a, a more liberal way of looking at that but that this is, the pension funds exist not to produce infrastructure, they exist to make sure that pensions can be paid when, um, when they are due and when the liabilities fall due and, and it is the case that none that I'm aware of the local government pension schemes at the moment, funds at the moment are fully funded. All are less than 100% funded. So, so, I mean, for example, a number of pension funds over the years have decided that they would look at ethical investment and they wouldn't invest in tobacco because tobacco kills. It kills people here. So, so pension funds are able to, to make that decision in terms of the actual the, the, the directors of the pension fund themselves. And it's like, in terms of the rate of return, you may not get as high a rate of return for investing in social housing in Scotland, but the social good of that, you could argue, is a, a much higher rate of return for the actual pension fund members themselves. I'm just trying to trying to work that out, and I'm trying to get back to because my my experience of these discussions is that these discussions take place at a level that most people don't understand, and we never actually move forward. And I'm trying to find a way of thinking to move forward. If you take Fife Council, for example, Fife Council currently have a programme of 2,700 houses being built. As part of that, they would have had to work out exactly how much was going to come in year on year for those houses, and it is a guaranteed income. Um, they put the rents up, I think, by an additional 1% to help finance that over that period, and they went out and they borrowed that money. So it seems to me that surely if there was a way that pension funds could actually look at a, a political directive coming for government at the Scottish level and local authorities to say we want to use pension funds to finance a major housing programme over the next 30 years, then what's to stop us doing that? Um, can I maybe add to that? Because we have in the submission from uh, Strathclyde Pension Fund um, the statement, the limits on partnership investments contained in the Local Government Pension Scheme Scotland Management and Investment of Funds regulations provide a particular impediment to further investment. Is this one of the things which would stop uh, these kind of things going on. Mr Daughtry. Yeah, can I, take, I, mean, I think we've, we've covered that in the SPPA paper that the Scottish Government recognises that these limits need to be reviewed um, and there may be a question mark about whether there are any limits required but that would be for the Scheme Advisory Board to, to decide. Um, we've not heard widely. And is this on, on high up the agenda of the new Advisory Board? Yes. Because I think this is key for all of us here yes, to know. It is. it is. I mean, the Scheme Advisory Board could, for example, take, a, take an early view on whether there needs to be some short-term change to limits as part of a longer-term review of whether the limits are required at all. There's already a duty uh, in, the, in the regulations, in Regulation 11, which requires pension fund, local government pension funds 
to have diversity in their portfolio. Okay, I think what would be very useful for the committee is for us to get an indication after your first meeting and the, probably the subsequent ones as well of your work programme so we, we can clearly see how you are setting about bringing down some of these barriers. Mr Watson, I think you were... Yeah. Uh, I'm to happy to give that assurance uh, as one of the Joint Secretaries that, that we're more than happy to, to do that, I'm sure. And it, it will be an issue for discussion tomorrow's meeting about what the work programme will be. We put a draft in. This is, this is, this is part of that. I think the, um, the other thing that's in the work plan, which I think touched on the point that Alec Rowley was making, is some of the uh, other constraints. I think the, the investment regulations go back to a time where... Uh, there was there was a view that you had to be fairly prescriptive about the the constraints on pension funds to stop them doing mad and crazy things, and I think probably the world's moved on a wee bit. And uh, and I my my own personal view would be that I think we could be a lot more flexible there with having a broad guidance which says you know you don't do mad and crazy things, but rather than saying you must have five percent here and ten percent there, because if you look at um, Chad's paper, you know, he he summarises in the annex the current limits which are very, fairly prescriptive. And I, I think in, in the current environment, we might say to ourselves, do we need to be that prescriptive to local authorities from the centre? Or could we have a more general duty of the sort that you might find more commonly in the, in the public sector? That doesn't get round the point Alec Rowley was raising, which is the, essentially the constraints of fiduciary duty. Now, there's a complicated legal issue, which I won't bore you with, around you know, the status of uh, the various people, both councillors and our own members who are involved in the pension boards and, and committees about their status as, as trustees or not but I think it's fairly clear there is a fiduciary duty the question is I think we need to tease out what the scope is to do that and Alec Rowley is quite right pension funds have found ways um, to involve to essentially make views about environmental social disinvestment campaigns on fossil fuels all sorts of things like that but they do so in the context of yeah, as long as it doesn't undermine the financial viability of the fund. And I think there's a, there's a scope within that that isn't well understood, and I think we do need to issue some guidance and advice around that area. And again, that's something that's been presented to the Scheme Advisory Board tomorrow for some clarity. I think it would be extremely useful for us to, to get that work programme, to see the things that you're working through, um, because I think we'll probably find later, while um, some panels, uh, some funds have, uh, have got ethical policies in place, others do not, uh, because they've been told that that may have uh, fiduciary implications. Alec, thank you. Um, Claire Adamson, please. Um, it, it's really um, a, a supplementary to what we've just been talking about. Um, um, what I was um, wanting to understand, um, and I suppose it's a general question for four members of the panel, but maybe a very specific question to Mr Morris in terms of he, the influence, he, if any, that they've been able to do. It's about the whole um, procurement side of what happens once the investment has been made, because, for instance, could an ethical policy include something that said they would only invest in living wage accredited employers? Um, or, or could there actually be um, uh, clauses, I'm um, thinking of some of the payback orders in terms of renewable energy about number of apprenticeships created in an area um, as the procurement and the building goes ahead? <laughs> Who wants to take a stab at that first? Yeah, we, I mean, we, we, Mr. We, Morris, we, we, we um, when we are procuring contracts for our, our, our local investments, are, are, are always keen to have in place um, measures which are helpful. With it. So, so the number of apprentices, for example, um, on one St Peter's Square, there were there have been. Uh, I would be guessing, but it's a very significant number of apprentices. It's, it's clearly in our builder, and, and, they, and they come onto the site as well as work at, at other sites as well. So, 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 so that is, is something which is fairly standard. Um, with, 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 with our house builder, they do some community activity as, as well. So, so yes, that, that's something which is capable of being done. But, but, but generally speaking, it's something that the builders are actually wanting to, to do. The, 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 the scale of builder... Uh, so, so, for example, our house builder is, is weights. It, it, it's, it's, they're all going to be the size of entities who we're dealing with because of the scale of, of contracts that we're letting. Um, but at the same time, the, 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 the people who we appoint to do the work are delivering it at, at, at a competitive price. Okay, Mr. Watson. 
Uh, not surprisingly, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to agree with that. Um, obviously, you've probably seen our, 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 our work both on the Procurement Act and you'll be very shortly seeing uh, uh, comments on the new Procurement Regulations. Consultation ends, ends tomorrow and uh, we'll be publishing, along with the whole civil, civil society coalition, our view about how we can use procurement in, in, a, in a more effective way. And certainly pension funds are not exempt from that in our view. I think uh, it is possible to do that and it's possible to do that within the constraints of fiduciary duty. I think there are very clear business benefits to living wage, for example, which you could in quite quite happily include in the same way as is being proposed under the uh, procurement regulations to, to, to achieve that. Uh, and I think that's true for wider environmental considerations, particularly when, at the end of the day, this is public money as well as our members' money. It's a mixture of both. Uh, and I think the broader goals of, of government, which you know, everyone signs up to in terms of climate change, etc., are all things that you can include there. The test, again, I I think you can get round the test there is do, does pulling these things have any material detriment to the to the fund I think the answer to that generally is no but I think yeah, the way you word it the way you do it just needs a little bit of teasing and a bit of guidance and, and help there I think would, would avoid us getting into any difficulties uh, do you, Mr White or Mr Daughtry have anything to add to that Mr White uh, just I would say to, to, if in major procurements um, the procuring authority quite often will stipulate these things rather than the provider of finance, so in, in Dumfries and Galloway Hospital, there will be a community benefits clause as part of the contract that will stipulate a lot of this. So, so in, in public procurement practice, that's widespread and actually is wholly accepted by the private sector. I think if you're going to go more widely and say pension funds as investors should only invest in things where that can be guaranteed, I think as they quite often are small investors in a much bigger fund or smaller investors in uh, equities on a worldwide basis, I think you might l start to either increase the monitoring costs or limit their opportunity to invest because I'm not sure at the moment they could actually put their hands in hearts and say that's something they could control being a very small shareholder in a very big fund or a very big company uh, that might trade globally, for instance. So I think procurers absolutely, and in a local investment base, I think that would happen should that greater focus on local investment happen, which I think we'd all like to see happen by pension funds. But in that wider portfolio, I think we would need to tread carefully. Mr Daughtry? Yeah, and I think I'd just like to, to make sure that the committee understands that the regulations always re already require a statement of invest investment principles by each of the 11 funds. And that's meant to take account of their environmental social governance responsibilities. It's entirely possible for them to set out that that would be their preference for investing in those. But at the heart of this is there always going to be a, a balance to make sure that an appropriate, however you define that, rate of return for the investment comes back to the pension fund. And again, it just perhaps to follow up on something uh, Mr Rowley was saying earlier on, it's helpful to remember that, that a, a, a pension scheme member will, of course, want, in the, in the case of the local government scheme in particular, perhaps, want to make sure investment is going to the right areas. At the same time, there is a, a triennial valuation. Every three years, there's a valuation of the scheme. If the scheme is not producing enough in the way investment return, what will happen is that there will be a funding gap. And I've, I've already referred to the fact that the, the funds are not 100% funded just now. That, that's not a massive concern, but it does mean that they have got less assets on current values than the liabilities they've got. If too give a big a gap appears, what has to happen then is employer contribution rates have to go up to try and pick up that gap. So if you're not getting the right rate of return, of course as an employee you want to make sure money is going in the right place. On the other hand, you don't want to find a situation where you're working for an employer which hasn't got enough money to spend on other services because it's spending all its money on investing in a pension fund. Claire. Thank you. For those answers, I've got a final question um, just for Mr Morris, I'm afraid. Um, uh, obviously, this is a long-term investment um, and, and the return is going to happen over a long time for the, the, the houses you have in place at the moment. Um, the Conservatives announced a short time ago that they're going to extend the right to buy to social housing. If that were to come to pass, how would that affect the business model you have at the moment? Um, would, wouldn't affect us, because the uh, the properties we've got as I say, are either, either for sale or, or, or they are market rent and they're on long lease. 
to in, in, in effect to a landlord. I mean, one of the things which has been very helpful to us has been helped to buy has been help, very helpful for us. It, 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 it's in, it's made it easier for some of our half, half our uh, purchasers have used help to buy, which means they can buy a house with a five percent deposit and twenty percent input in terms of equity uh, loan from the government, and, and that's that's been very helpful to us. Okay, but that, that long-term landlord, would that be a housing association at the moment? Or it's, it's, the, 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 land, mm -hmm. the tenant stroke landlord, from our perspective, is, is a registered social landlord, yes. Yeah, okay. okay. Uh, Cameron Buchanan, please. Thank you very much indeed. Good morning. Um, we've heard quite a lot about Manchester, and I'm just wondering if this is typical of the English local authorities. Also, do you ever work together with other local authorities to invest at the same time? Right. Um, as... as, as, as you will probably have spotted uh, collaboration between local authorities e on the investment side is getting increasing profile. What's the purpose of collaboration? The purpose of collaboration is to drive down um, investment costs at one level. It's to provide more expertise at another level. But generally, the purpose of collaboration is to help produce higher net investment returns. Um, in terms of... Our, our, our own activities, we are keen to work with, 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 with other pension funds. Um, we have got one very, very concrete example. We've got an infrastructure partnership which, which is just established with London Pension Fund Authority, and, 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 and that, that, that's investing in infrastructure. And again, the purpose of that is, is to target investments at, at, at Manchester, London, but there aren't there aren't geographical barriers so that they can be investing outside there if the opportunities are there. But but again, the, the purpose of that partnership is to increase net returns to us. Um, we, we, we've got, uh, in our sense, we've got good relations with um, the the North West funds, and we've got good relations on M62 corridor. And so, in terms of with North West funds, we've got one or two examples whereby pooling together. We're, we're um, getting lower uh, fund, management, fund management fees in, 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 in some specialist areas. In terms of local investment, we, 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 we are um, at the higher end of the range in terms of our enthusiasm for local investments, and we've been doing it uh, for longer. Thank you. Thank you. So do you find that working together wo uh, actually works with another pension fund, or and do you, does Manchester lead in that case from what you're saying it does? In, 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 in the case of LPFA, yeah. our, 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 our agreement says that we will both provide a minimum number of staff to make sure that the joint venture works, and, and, and that minimum number of staff is, is equal on, on, on both sides. Um, from my perspective, I, 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 it, we, we've got, as I said, we've got one or two examples with, with other North West funds, whereby increasing our collective investment we're getting lower fees as a consequence of, 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 of doing that. And, and, and likewise, one of the things which I think will happen with London, again, that's one of the ways in which we'll uh, cut our costs, increase our net returns. Yeah. I'll, I'll stop there. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Willie Coffey, please. Thank you. Mr. Convener, I wonder if I could return to the point that uh, Mr. Dolce was um, leading us towards there when you were talking about fully funded schemes or not. I think you said that the 11 schemes that we've got, they're not fully funded. I, I take it they don't need to be fully funded in order to, in order to meet current obligations to, to pay pensions, for example. So I'm interested in what's been happening here. Is that a trend that's been happening over the past few years, that pension funds are becoming less fully funded? Maybe you can tell us by what amount. And, and is that what's leading to the the sort of imperative to find new ways, new opportunities for investment to, to top them up effectively. Mr. So, if that's, so if that's the case, what does the governance around all of that look like so that, so that people that are investing in the funds can be, can be assured that, that there will be some kind of payout to them when they, when they require it at a future date? Mr Daughtry. Yeah, I mean, just to be clear, that, that point was made in the context of balance to make sure that the right kind of level of return is coming in. There isn't a, a situation that the Scottish Government is concerned about the level of funding in the, the local government pension scheme in Scotland. Um, it is actually generally better funded, funded to a higher level than it, and the counterpart scheme for England and Wales. But it, 
it remains the fact that it's not 100% funded. Um, it's an interesting one because it rather depends on the day that you, you take an assessment of what the funding level is. Um, it's, it's broadly, I think it's maybe slightly down on where it was three years ago. Um, I'm not quite sure why the, the, the latest triennial valuations have only just been produced by the 11 funds. Um, and there is no concern, and wouldn't want anybody to think there's any concern, that pensions are un unable to be paid. So I, I think that covers all of those points for you. But where's the, I mean, where's, where's the imperative coming, though, for, for new investment in housing? I mean, it's great that we're doing that and you're doing that, but is, that, is it a necessity for, to, to make sure that the pension funds are being topped up to, to, to get that kind of return on investment in housing? Or is it, do you just... just what to do that? As a Mr. N n n now, from my perspective, now is the most difficult time, certainly in my working life, to be managing a pension fund. And, and, and what's the reason for that? We are shrink, generally speaking, our number of employees in the fund are shrinking. Our number of deferred and pensioner members are growing significantly. At, at, at our fund, the, the value of benefits paid exceeds the amount of contributions by 100 and odd million per year. Uh, we, we have investment income of 300 million coming in, so it's, it's, it's not too big a deal from a cash flow perspective, but it doesn't have to make things difficult. The number of employers is, 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 is growing rapidly um, in, 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 in English funds, and, and, and again, that makes it more complicated. And then when you superimpose on top of that the economic environment, where nobody in this room can ever, ever imagine, or could have imagined six years ago, that you'd have investment uh, interest rates at half percent, you'd have negative real returns. You, know, you can lend money to the German government for 10 years, and you don't even get back what you gave at the outset. You know, this is a weird, weird world in which we're living in. And how are liabilities priced? Liabilities, for, for many funds, are priced on the basis of what interest rates are. So the lower the interest rate is, the higher the value of liabilities. And, 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 and that, 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 that's a key reason, because investment returns are higher than actuarial assumption, and, and, and that's driving the, the increase in deficits. So, so it's a really, really tricky environment to managing a pension fund. And you look on the 10-year view for what investment returns are going to be, on the uh, mo mo most, most investments in bonds are going to deliver nil real returns. This is tough. So what, what's, what, one of the reasons why we do local investments is... We, we're, we're enthusiastic about it, and we believe that we're capable of, 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 of generating commercial returns, which is something that will, it won't make a, a massive contribution, but it's something which will contribute positively to our funding position in the long term. Mr. Watson, please. Yeah, I mean, I don't disagree with, with any. I think it is, it's, it, it is a challenging time for anybody involved in pensions. As I said, uh, you know, I have to deal with them in the, all the public schemes and the private sector ones as well. But I think we should remember what we mean by fully funded. You know, fully funded is essentially, as Chad says, it's, it's essentially that your, your income matches your liabilities. You only have to pay that out if everybody in that pension fund left tomorrow morning. Uh, now, some of our members might, might fancy a bit of early retirement, but it's not going to happen, I'm afraid. Uh, so, the, you know, the reality of having to, to meet that immediately just isn't there. It's just the accounting tools that we have to uh, do. That doesn't mean we haven't got an issue. I'd also say on the last valuation uh, that we had, obviously there's one at the moment, we're waiting to see the numbers coming out of it. And the last one, Scottish local government pension funds were in the main all in the mid, the average was around the mid 90s you know now let me tell you from I've got schemes in the private and the voluntary sector who would only in their wildest dreams would be at that level at that level of funding there are private sector schemes that are at 50 and 60 percent there are voluntary sector schemes there so 90 percent some of our funds are even overfunded at the last evaluation 104 105 percent so you know it, I'm not saying that that means we haven't got a challenge we, we certainly have but you know I think we just could be very careful we don't start a panic around the view that there's, there's a problem in terms of the investment there is an issue and and funds are having to be much more aware certainly in recent years in local government obviously 50,000 jobs have gone out of local government since they well nearly 60,000 since the crash uh, so that a lot of those uh, have gone not all by any means but a lot of those have gone in various forms of early retirement that has a cash flow implication so when you're investing and looking at pension funds you need to probably have a little bit you look you have to keep an eye on where 
public sector finance is going to go. So if it looks like there's going to be further job losses, you have to have more in cash or at least readily um, uh, available funds rather than 25-year investments for obvious, for obvious reasons. So these are all, it's a changing environment, but it's not one that we should be panicking about. Okay. Willie, please. That's very helpful. Very helpful. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Can I thank you, gentlemen, for um, your submissions uh, today? Um, I'll suspend uh, and we'll have a five-minute comfort break and a change of witnesses, please.
Uh, I'd like to welcome the second panel, uh, Richard McIndo of Strathclyde Pension Fund and Head of Pensions with Glasgow City Council, Steve White uh, with the North East of Scotland Pension Fund and Head of Finance at Aberdeen City Council, uh, and Brian Smale with the Falkirk Pension Fund and Head of Finance at Falkirk Council. Before we move uh, on to questions, do you have any opening remarks you'd like to make, gentlemen? No? Okay, we have heard um, from others about uh, the, the restrictions that there are on local uh, pension funds investment activity. Uh, we've heard uh, about some pension funds having uh, ethical uh, policies in place. Could you explain the position of your own pension fund in that regard in terms of ethical policy and what you see as the major barriers uh, for Scottish pension funds in investing in uh, local projects. Could we start with Mr White, please? Um, yeah, I mean, one of the big barriers, I suppose, is um, the, I suppose, in the last sort of five, ten years, the move of um, the financing of kind of infrastructure and public sector projects into kind of NPD, PFI type deals, which has seen a number of kind of private sector elements come into the, the, the funding market around that, that's kind of opened the, the eyes, I suppose, of the kind of pension fund in terms of those kind of opportunities. Um, certainly trying to get involved in those kinds of projects, um, investing in infrastructure, the accounting regulations clearly are a, a barrier to, to try and get into that kind of marketplace. Certainly within Aberdeen, we did look at the potential for our 3Rs project to buy out the, the debt when it was being sold by the financier um, probably about 12, 12, 18 months ago. Um, and clearly the barrier there was the, the restrictions from the accounting side. We, we discussed that with the SFT and the Scottish Government at the time to see if there's a way around that, um, especially given that the debt was being sold at uh, below par value. So, um, so clearly those kind of barriers, I think, are probably one of the restrictions we'd like to, 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 to address. In terms of the um, Schools for Future projects, um, there's obviously a number of um, projects that are going forward. Um, with, within the agreement that we have with um, Hubco, we're able to purchase subordinate debt, um, but again, it's a, a small amount of public sector money that can really go into that. And again, even trying to use the pension fund um, as, as an investment vehicle for that, um, again, there's, there's, there's limits around what we can, we can do, but again, I think these types of kind of infrastructure projects is where I think the pension funds could have a potential to come forward and invest, um, and, and they have a strong covenant um, sitting in behind those investments because it's obviously the local authority um, that would be invested or kind of funding that. So um, I suppose that would be my initial kind of assessment of the, the restrictions that we um, face. In terms of uh, Aberdeen, um, Donald Duckert, uh, one of your housing guys, has got a fairly uh, substantial and robust, it seems to me, uh, mid-market rent plan. Would it be a wise investment for the pension fund to get involved in that, in that housing investment? Absolutely. I mean, at the moment, we're just starting to pull together the kind of procurement that will sit around all of that and, and to go to the marketplace. And the pension fund is very much in discussions um, with the, those officers um, to discuss how um, potentially the pension fund could invest um, or certainly put in some sort of kind of investment um, with it's about a thousand houses over the next two years that are looking to kind of put to, together. Again, trying to find the kind of package that that would um, allow to work, because clearly if you're looking at affordable housing, you really are looking at kind of some sort of, um, uh, I suppose, grant to, to kind of make that financial model stack up. So it's about trying to get the right mix between affordable mid-market um, and, and private um, housing and absolutely the kind of level of infrastructure projects that the council um, is producing at the moment. Certainly the pension fund is now starting to look at the, the potential for investing in there and housing is just one of those, one of those elements. We've currently got the city centre master plan for, for Aberdeen and how that's going to uh, transpire over the next sort of 5, 10, 15 years. We have the um, city deal, um, which has kind of been supportive in principle from the Scottish Government and the UK Government. Again, that's looking at some in the region of about 2.9 billion of investment in Aberdeen over the next sort of 20, 30 years. So again, looking at those kind of areas of where the pension fund could potentially step in and, and, and look to try and invest um, and 
get the level of return that it would need to, to justify that kind of investment. But again, as I say, it comes back to making sure that the return to the pension fund is, is, is there. Thank you. Uh, if I can move to Mr. Schmeo, uh, Falkirk is seen as being one of the trailblazers in breaking down barriers and using pension funds uh, for local investment. Uh, could you tell us how uh, you've gone about your business, please? Yeah, thank you, convener. Uh, this essentially flowed from um, our pensions committee uh, taking a, uh, an interest initially in exploring the potential to um, target investment, infrastructure investment, uh, on a more local basis. Um, in the matter of social housing, we and the committee took quite a long time of a journey of exploration, if you like, to get to the point that we were comfortable this was an appropriate um, option to pursue. Um, that trail included a, a, a seminar conference we hosted in Falkirk, to which a number of um, relevant stakeholders were invited, uh, legal firms, potential investors, um, RSLs, um, all used to build up a, a, a picture of the potential, um, as we're obliged to do under the regulations. The fund also has a specialist um, advisor uh, who fed into that mix. And at the end of the journey last year, the Pension Committee took the view, uh, following a competitive tendering process, that... Um, and having heard the offers that were coming from the market, because we went effectively put a wide remit to the market just to see what was out there. So we were quite flexible in terms of um, allowing the market uh, to come forward with um, uh, innovation and initiatives. And from that process, we selected a particular tender offer and are actively um, pursuing that at the moment in terms of actual investment in housing. In fact, I can say yesterday the Council's relevant committee um, affirmed from the Council side, bearing in mind the pension side is separate, um, a proposal that would harness part of the uh, 15 million that's been allocated to social housing for actual investment in the funds area, and that's about 90 houses. So it's, it's moving forward. Things will start soon to happen on the ground. Thank you. Uh, Mr. McIndale, could you give us the Strathclyde perspective, please, about uh, barriers? Um, well, our perspective is there are no absolute barriers. There's no, no absolute impediment to investment in infrastructure or indeed in investment in, in local infrastructure or Scottish infrastructure. Um, Strathclyde has invested £275 million to date, starting very recently, because infrastructure, infrastructure wasn't really a recognised asset class, a recognised investment strategy um, for institutional pension funds until the last few years. So starting quite recently, we've invested £275 million in infrastructure, much of it in Scotland. Um, we've done that through a, a mechanism we created internally called our New Opportunities Portfolio whereby we recognised that the investment structure we had, which is a fairly um, fairly commonplace structure, I guess, amongst uh, UK pension funds was to appoint external investment managers to run usually very large portfolios um, of investments, mostly listed investments, um, and to a large extent overseas investments. We are a global investor. We recognised that that really didn't give us much of a facility um, to invest locally. And in 2009, we created that facility called it our new opportunities portfolio. It's not a local investment portfolio, um, but it, it has a very wide remit to invest in all sorts of things. But from the outset, it has a, had a preference for what we call impact investments. Um, and that means investments with um, some positive impact, either in social governance, environmental terms, or local investments. To date, the majority of investments through the um, New Opportunities Portfolio have had um, some form of local element. Starting, its initial focus was on um, small and medium-sized enterprises in Scotland. We made a couple of investments in that area uh, through Scottish Loan Fund, in which we were a, a, a founder investor, create a creation of Scottish government, effectively. Um, 
panoramic equity fund, uh, which is a UK-wide investment remit, but uh, located in Glasgow after we agreed uh, to, to, to co-invest with them, um, and a couple of other in vehicles, sorry, other vehicles. Um, from, we, we were, I guess, from the outset more familiar with company investment. We're largely an equity investor. We're, we're a very well-established private equity investor. But um, quite early in this, in this journey, um, we recognised that there might be an opportunity in, uh, in infrastructure, in housing. Um, and uh, we, we wrote that into the remit of the portfolio in, in 2012, that we would focus on infrastructure and housing um, and, and economic development. Deals we have done to date include um, a couple of housing or housing-related investments, and most notably uh, the, the, the City Legacy project, which, um, which built the um, Athletes' Village for the Commonwealth Games in Glasgow for last year, uh, which subsequent to the Games has been re retrofitted um, and become 700 units of, um, of um, social or um, mid-market housing uh, and various other facilities. Uh, we were a, 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 not the major part of the funding package for that, but a very significant part. We provided the cash flow funding, which was actually, I think, the last piece in the jigsaw of the, of the funding package. Um, we're well uh, aware of the um, Athletes Village and uh, uh, as ma many members have, have visited there. Are there any other housing elements that uh, the Strathclyde Fund have been involved in? We've recently committed, um, made a couple of commitments. Uh, one for a supported living residential development, which will be UK-wide, and a specific res residential project within East Lothian. Um, again, for that one, we're providing the cash flow funding um, as, as part of a, of a larger uh, funding package. We are looking at various other housing projects, which may come to fruition shortly. Um, but so far, we haven't identified one where all the pieces um, sort of fit together at this stage. Thank you. Um, and in terms of ethical statements, could you, um, as I asked, give uh, an indication of what your own pension funds do in terms of ethical investment? Mr White? I mean, in terms of ethical investment, obviously, we would look at um, the kind of wider global markets. Um, but certainly the council's view, uh, the pension fund's view is, you know, that we need to look at returns. Um, so, you know, to be honest, the pension fund does invest in, in tobacco companies. And arms. Um, um, I believe so, yes. So in, in that respect, at this stage, um, the, the pension fund quite clearly is looking to get those returns from those high-yielding investments um, and, and companies. So really um, what we're saying is that the North East Pension Fund doesn't really have an ethical investment policy? It does have an ethical policy in terms of um, uh, the kind of wider world and you know obviously not investing in kind of war zones and, and things like that but in terms Just of the arms that are going to the war zones <laughs> um i mean uh, i would need I, to look and see which exactly companies we invested in but I, I think it would be very interesting to get a, a copy of the the ethical statement that the northeast says that it adheres to uh, mr smale uh, convener, um, in common with all funds, uh, as you may have heard Mr Daughtry say earlier, we're required to have a statement of an investment principles, and that's, that's kept under, under review. Um, I suppose the essential part of the um, ethical stance is one of proactive engagement with companies uh, where there are issues, uh, and that's done on our behalf. Maybe I'll just cut to the crunch like I did with Mr. White. Do you invest in tobacco companies, Mr. Smale? And also in al alcohol and companies that sell fizzy drinks, in arms. et cetera, et cetera. Yes. So it's, uh, I think I'm making the point, where do you draw the line? Okay. There's a whole range of products that are um, not benign attributes uh, attributed to them and think, a pension fund would have some difficulty in de deciding where to draw that line. Okay, I think it would be very interesting again for us to get your statement uh, uh, of intent there. Uh, Mr McIndoe, the Strathclyde situation? 
Uh, similarly, we, we, we don't exclude any um, particular sector or category of company from our investment policy. That's, uh, that's uh, common amongst uh, almost every UK pension fund, fund, fund I know of. Uh, they don't exclude investments. There are, there are various other ways to achieve um, ethical or environmental, social and, and govern, governance aims, which usually involve but engaging... But not through pension funds? Not through disinvestment from companies. OK, but thank you. Again, if we could get a, a statement of your uh, investment uh, principles, that would be extremely useful indeed. Uh, Alec Rowley, please. Um, hi, good morning. Could I start with Strathclyde? I, I actually think this is really quite impressive, the, the work that's going on with the Strathclyde Pension Fund. Um, and I did, although I've never visited the Commonwealth Games Village, I did see one of the first tenants going into the house in there, and it was it was a great story, and it was it was great to see. Um, and it's that type of investment. Could I ask specifically on, on this, have you had to increase the expertise within the management within the Strathclyde Fund or did you have to buy that expertise in? Because you seem to be ahead of the game with quite a lot of pension funds in Scotland in terms of what you're doing. And does pension fund managers and that come together and, and share this type of information? Mr Mackendale, um, first, please. Uh, I think y yes to, to, to both questions there. Um, yes, we had to, to increase the expertise. This was infrastructure, new opportunities, was a slightly different departure from us from our um, previous investment strategy. Initially, the early investments we, we, we managed through our existing resource, but quite early we realised we would need more resource. To date, we've only hired one um, individual focusing specifically on this portfolio. Um, we have also bought some expertise um, externally in the market. Uh, the, the, the portfolio continues to expand. We've just increased its capacity to 5% of total fund. The resource will need to expand alongside that. Um, the second part of the question... In well, terms of sharing information, and perhaps I can expand on that a bit and, and widen it a bit, is that I know that when I raise questions, we... we we finance departments like Fife, for example, um, where they say, well, if you were going to go for a big investment in, in an area like housing, you would need a number of funds to come together. Is that, is, is that the way to try and move this forward to get the funds in Scotland to work together? Or, or, or is some funds too small to take on the type of thing that Strathclyde's taking on? Because Strathclyde, I assume, is much bigger than, than, than many of these funds. It's, it's, Yes, Strath Strathclyde is by, by, by some distance the largest of, of the 11 funds in Scotland. And potentially, yes, that's the way um, uh, to, to take these things forward. A, a fairly good example of that is the pensions infrastructure platform, uh, which we're a founder investor in, uh, which brought together um, a number of the leading pension funds in the UK, not all local authority funds, um, uh, but West Midlands are an investor I in that as well. Um, and it was billed as um, an investment vehicle by pension funds for pension funds. Uh, it's making very good progress. Uh, it has agreed its first two investment tranches. We've committed um, 70 million to it contractually and 100 million in principle. Uh, it's been slow prog progress. The practicalities of bringing together a group of investors um, are, are, are numerous, even if they're essentially like-minded. We and these other funds are essentially like-minded, but when, when it comes down to the detail of what you want to do, the details of the strategy, the details of some of your, your own um, investment rules, your governance, getting things agreed, uh, these things take time. Could that sort of model apply in Scotland? Um, yes. Um, Scottish Loan Fund, which was a vehicle created um, for, for investment, um, by pension funds and other institutions in Scottish small and medium-sized enterprises, uh, is, you know, as a fund of that nature, where a number of investors were, were brought together. Uh, do we speak amongst ourselves? Yes, frequently. Uh, has that led to any collective investment? No. Um, there are some shared investments. I think um, Aberdeen are also an investor in SLF. Uh, but yeah, there's, there's potential there. Why is that potential not being realised up until this point? I guess um, 
The, well, we, ha we have lots of investment potential. We're focusing on a whole bunch of different things. There are other people in the market um, trying to create infrastructure deals, housing deals. Um, perhaps they're a, 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 um, a more obvious facilitator of these things. Um, the, a project like that does tend to need a facilitator, somebody to bring funds together, coordinate. So why, why not put in place a facilitator, say Strathclyde or the North East or Falkirk? It's not impossible, but it's not, it's, it's not been part of what, what we've done today. We are an investor, usually in vehicles that other people have created. The creation of a vehicle is a different, different skill set. Mr White, why do you think that, ha that hasn't happened thus far? I mean, I think the point Mr. Uh, McIntyre was just making, I mean, you, you need a vehicle to invest in. The pension funds are looking to invest in the vehicle. So I think the collaboration needs to come probably from the council side to create those vehicles. Um, and that collaborative working, I suppose, has been um, gaining impetus over the last couple of years where um, local authorities are now working much more closely with one another. So, for example, the city deal um, in the northeast um, is a collaboration between Aberdeenshire and Aberdeen City. Um, so that kind of collaboration is now starting to happen and those kind of infrastructure projects are now going to start coming to fruition. Those vehicles, I think, by definition, will then have to, to be formulated to allow that to be delivered. The formulation of those vehicles then allows the pension funds the opportunity to, to do the financial due diligence around the, the vehicle to see whether there's a return that fits in with their investment strategy um, and would allow them to, to, to invest in those vehicles. So I think it's that kind of um, stage that we're at in the process, but there's definitely a, a greater move um, um, towards that kind of collaboration across Scotland. Mr. Smale. Um, a couple of comments, convener. Um, there has been um, hitherto exploration um, across the funds and also involving the Scottish Government's Financial um, Innovation Unit to, to see whether some vehicle could indeed be pulled together. Um, this was perhaps several, well, a couple of years ago, and I think at that time there was perhaps across funds a scepticism as to, in terms of social housing, um, the um, alignment with the objectives of funds. I think that's matured and moved forward, as you've heard from various speakers today, and maybe the market is better placed for such a vehicle to come on stream. My second point is that the fund that we've invested um, 30 million into is an initial investment in a housing fund for Scotland that has, um, the fund manager has a potential, though I don't think it's a rigid figure, of up to 150 million that could be channeled through that source. So that's one vehicle that's already in place. So I think it's, a, it's an emerging and developing market. I think that's useful, Mr. Spinell. Mr. Rowley. Yeah, I mean, I will, I will, the, the Strathclyde stuff, I will be sending to the Director of Finance at Fife, Mr. Brian Livingston, and saying to him, you know, this is the kind of investments I think that we'd want to see. But the, the evidence session we heard, the last evidence session we heard, they, they, they talked about zero return on, on bonds. Um, there was an example given the loaning money to or, or putting investment into Germany and, and not even getting your return back. So given, given where we are in the current financial climate and, and the, not just in this country but across Europe, I mean, is this a, actually a good time? If you were going to be guaranteed our own programme of investing in, in public housing, council housing across Scotland, and you're guaranteed a rate of return, is that not actually a more secure investment these days, given where some of the, the financial instability sits in the world? Who looks at that? Do your fund managers, could you maybe explain that bit to the committee? Who actually comes up with these, examines these types of investments that are possible? Who would look at, how, who would look at whether investing in public infrastructure in Scotland was a sound investment? And who ultimately makes these recommendations? Let's start with Mr Smale, please. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, if I jump back to the... the um, example I gave you with our social housing in terms of there was quite a, an elapsed period um, where our committee took the time 
to get a, a, a proper handle and understanding of the potentials of the market. And that was done with a, a range of inputs from various sources, including uh, the fund's own advisors. And having undertaken that journey, that research, gained that understanding, the committee reached a view that an investment um, of perhaps 2% of the fund into social housing did represent um, a proper and attractive uh, option for us. Uh, I think, as you allude to, social housing and Indian housing generally um, has the, the attraction of, of, of marrying very well with pension fund liabilities in terms of its long-term nature and um, frequently inflation-adjusted returns. So those were uh, factors and attributes that fed into our decision-making process whereby we concluded this was a, a proper um, level of investment. I think you could perhaps categorise it as a win-win as a because taking on board all the comments that have been made earlier about the fiduciary aspect and having to operate within a framework of regulations and indeed case law, each fund has to take responsibility because we stand alone legally as legal entities, albeit we operate within a broader uh, framework, has to take a view as to how it will navigate its way through um, the issues um, that um, pervade, you know, investment decisions of, of this ilk. But I think, you know, the fund reached a conclusion, obviously, as the Manchester Fund funded in terms of housing as well, that the return was consistent with overall fund and objectives. And the other part of the win was it was it had the capacity to um, enhance local infrastructure. So I think that was it in a nutshell. Okay, Mr. White. I think the point I would make is that what, what we've probably seen over the last um, three or four years is a much more, I suppose, firm understanding that there is a housing shortage um, in Scotland. Certainly in the northeast, the, um, the level of um, private sector development has continued um, quite rapidly. Um, but again, there's very different dynamic economic conditions in Aberdeen. That by itself has kind of now led to a real housing shortage in Aberdeen for kind of mid-market types of, of rents. The, the economic conditions in Aberdeen are such that the mid-market type of rents um, that you would traditionally expect um, are considerably higher than they would be elsewhere in the country, which means that um, the ability of the council to attract key workers such as teachers, social workers, the health service to attract nurses and, and the police force to treat, attract police, police officers um, has resulted in the, if you like, almost a, a market failure which is now requiring um, the public sector to step in and correct that. That is now creating the vehicle um, or, or that is now creating a vehicle which will result in new house building for those types of marketplaces. That then, by definition, op offers the opportunity for funders to come in on the back of that. So I think what you're kind of seeing is, I suppose, a new emerging kind of market, which is why, you know, we haven't seen a heavy level of investment from certainly in the northeast um, pension funds because that market condition is only really now starting to materialise and, and really pinch on the, the, the local economy and the growth of the city going forward. So hence, I think the what we're now kind of, as I say, see is this kind of emerging um, demand and the effectively the council stepping in to start thinking how it's going to close that demand so a thousand council houses or that's right a thousand houses over the next um sort of two three two years um effectively that's going to off offer the opportunity for the, the likes of the northeaster pension pension fund to step in and, and invest and get a return um but again that needs to be measured against the other returns that you might potentially get we heard earlier about you know you'll get a nil return if you were to invest in germany However, you know, it, you can invest elsewhere and still get a positive return. So, um, again, we can't just look at one investment vehicle and say that's the, the comparator. And the whole point of the, the portfolio is to have it diversified so that you're not exposing yourself to one particular strong market area. So that where there is um, maybe a downturn in a particular area, you're still able to generate sufficient returns to meet your future um, liabilities. I think the question that Mr. Riley posed about fund managers remains unanswered there. So is it the fund managers that are guiding investment uh, in the main? Um, and, you know, who are these people? 
I think is the question that uh, I mean, we invest we with to. fund managers um, in, in infrastructure UK wide. I mean, I think for the North East Pension Fund, it's about 300 million. I mean, but that's across the UK and it's, it's more investment type properties that, the, that they're looking to invest in. Um, we would certainly be looking initially, we would be looking to do that internally rather than through potential fund managers to assess these um, housing developments. What we would need to understand then is that do we have the expertise in house or do we need to take in uh, additional expertise to help facilitate that? So um, it's an emerging area for us to, 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 to watch and, and decide how we would like to take that forward. But we certainly wouldn't want to immediately start kind of engaging with fund managers specifically on social housing projects because clearly they will be charging um, fees around that. So we would need to understand what our capacity and capability was internally um, before we started looking at the specific use of um, fund managers for social housing projects. But in terms of the discussions that are being had at this moment, Mr White, are the fund managers that you currently have in place trying to put off um, your pension from fund from investing in social housing, for example? No. No. Grant. Uh, Mr McIndoe, please. In terms of the decision making of it, um, sure we've, 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 for the new opportunities portfolio, we've created a clear and robust governance process where officers will, will initially source investments um, through the market, through contacts. Um, we will filter those uh, to, uh, down, to, down to the ones most, I, I suppose, ready to, uh, to bring forward. Uh, they go to a board, including the Director of Finance. There's a second a sub, um, a, a board which is effectively a subcommittee of the main investment committee. Um, and any decision is ultimately with the investment committee. Throughout that process, um, th there may be reliance on a fund manager, uh, in which case we as officers will do extensive diligence on them. Um, they will then have to present to, to, to the various boards and, and potentially to the committee before a decision is made. Um, are our existing fund managers trying to put us off investment? No, one or two of them are actively trying to facilitate investment in housing. Um, I think the housing opportunity will come, the market housing opportunity. Uh, as I said earlier, we haven't quite found anything yet that we can invest in in scale. I think it will come. The social housing opportunity may be a little more difficult. The rate of return there um, remains a bit of an issue. Yes, where, it, it, where the covenant is very good with strong public sector entities and there's a clear income stream, that is very, very helpful. But I think um, registered social <coughs> landlords historically have been able to borrow at very low rates. Uh, the interest rate remains very low. Um, but as Mr Morris said earlier, the whole funding model for local government is based on a 3% real return. Uh, within our uh, local investment model, that translates to an absolute floor of 5% of per annum for any investment, so minimum hurdle of 5% per annum. Um, and then um, we need a return above that depending on the, the, the idiosyncratic risk of any individual investment. I think social housing still struggling to make that, that hurdle. Um, but but uh, affordable and mid-market housing, I think, will make it more easily, and that's probably coming. OK, thank you. Uh, Cameron Buchanan, please. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, you mentioned under Strathclyde in the practicalities, you mentioned that approving funding should not be underestimated. Each can represent a significant impediment. For a project to succeed, it needs strong, committed leadership to manage each of these stages. Stages. Do you provide strong and committed leadership? You mentioned in the Commonwealth Games that you were a significant uh, investor, but w were you leading it? And if so, do you lead any of the investments? Mr. McIndo. The, um, the pension fund was the pension fund was not leading um, the Commonwealth Games project. The, the council played a much bigger role in it, but the pension fund was not leading it. And it would be rare for the pension fund to lead an investment project. Um, it is, it's a different skill set. The creation of an investment vehicle is a different skill set. Um, mo most investment managers actually find the creation of the vehicle and the raising of funds and the coordinating of everything um, something of a distraction and extremely time consuming from the process of investing. We, we are an investor and the creation of those vehicles and coordination isn't, isn't really our business. So, so no, we don't typically lead investments. Uh, 
Okay, thank you very much. Okay, you. John Wilson, please. Thank you, Convener. Good morning. Uh, just to go back to the issue about the expertise, uh, and I'm looking at the Strathclyde submission here, and it says that you know, in practice, however, pension funds have often not found infrastructure investment easy to achieve. Reasons cited are lack of in-house expertise, high external manager fees, risk inherent in greenfield infrastructure investment, blah, blah, blah. Why have the pension funds not brought in the in-house expertise to actually deal with some of these issues that you've identified? Because clearly, if it's high management fees that are putting you off from investing in particular areas, then has there not been a lost opportunity to actually invest in the in-house expertise so the pension fund could actually take that forward without having to go to external managers? Mr. McIndoe. Well, we, we are taking that opportunity and trying to take that forward. Um, those, that, that, those particular things you mentioned, um, which are in my paper, are, are a quote actually from um, the, our initial investment proposal for participation in the pension, pensions infrastructure platform. So they were some of the reasons that the pensions infrastructure platform was created um, to, to, to overcome those barriers. Uh, we are a founder investor. Um, we, there are further tranches of investment to come, to, to, to come through that. It has successfully overcome those hurdles. It is now that, that, that collective of pension funds has recently appointed um, a chief executive with great expertise um, in, uh, in the infrastructure market. Um, the first tranche of investment was through a fund, but uh, again, the collective was able to, to negotiate uh, a, a fee for the vehicle, which was some way below uh, what I think would be market. So, so that is happening, at least in, 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 in that particular instance. And I think there will be more of that. John? Can I just to take it, you mentioned the external manager fees. Can I ask the three panel members what the average costs of administering the pension schemes that are being administered by local authorities if you, in terms of the, the turnover in terms of the pension fund? Because if, if you're com comparing external market fees, then there are fees borne by the administration of the pension fund. And how does that compare with say, wholly handing over the pension fund to an external manager. Mr McIndoe, first, please. So, well, our, our, to, to put a number on it, our um, investment management cost is a little below 0.2 of a percent of investments under management. Um, that is all external cost. For individual investments, it varies from a very, very um, small percent, so less than... 0.1 of a percent for um, passive listed uh, equities to 1 percent or more for more complex investments, uh, which would include actually in infrastructure funds, which typically would um, ha have, uh, they're, they're a complex investment, they need a lot of management. So a, a typical market fee for an infrastructure fund, I think would be at least 1 percent, uh, usually with some performance element attached to that as well. 0.2% overall. What's that in cash terms? Because 0.2% doesn't sound very much, but I'm sure if you're looking at the Strathclyde pension fund, 0.2% adds up to a huge amount of money. 18 million um, per annum in our 2013-14 accounts. The 14-15 figure will be significantly higher because the, the um, um, the disclosure rules have changed, so we'll, we'll see um, higher figures disclosed in this year's accounts because they will include not just what we pay um, as investment management fees, but various costs um, underlying those investments, so transaction costs, um, and where we invest in, in funds or fund of funds, uh, all of the management fees at every layer. So eight, 18 million last year, but there will be a bigger number this year. Any indication of what that number will be? No, it'll be, we've got another, another six weeks, I guess, to put that number together. OK. Mr White? I mean, the cost of administering the fund internally um, is, is probably around about a million for um, the administration of payment of benefits and the investment side internally that we have. 
the fee structures again for the individual fund managers will vary depending on the type of um, investments that we're asking them to undertake on our behalf. Um, and again, I'd be struggling to provide the number off the top of my head, but it would be several million. Um, but again, the, the new disclosures are a bit like Strathclyde until we actually get the f uh, 14, 15 um, accounts completed. Um, we won't have that number, but happy to supply that to the committee once we um, get to that position. Uh, I think that would be very useful for us. Mr. Smale, please. I think um, the, the framework that Mr. McIndoe uh, outlined in terms of percentage rates would be common across all funds and the cash equivalent would be proportionate to, to the funds. Maybe one other point I could helpfully make is that um, another strand of our local um, infrastructure investment in, additional, in addition to the social housing is a partnership arrangement we have with the Lothian Pension Fund. And in our evaluation of that, um, we concluded that by using that channel and their in-house capacity and expertise being a much larger fund than, than ourselves, um, saved us on management costs, um, or, or the costs would be circa a third of what we would have expected to pay had we used an external manager. So I think there was a very clear-cut example, for us anyway, of uh, using in-house potential, albeit not in our own fund, to save on management costs. Again, it would be very interesting for us to see those numbers too, Mr. Smeal. If they could be passed on to the clerks, I'd be grateful. John. Just on that point uh, from Mr. Smeal, what opportunities and the, the, the take on the Lothian and the Falkirk uh, working relationship in terms of uh, utilising expertise within different pension funds, what opportunities are there Scotland-wide for the 11 pension funds to work in that collaborative fashion uh, to look at how they carry forward the investment programmes? Mr Smale. Um, th there, there may well be potential um, on infrastructure in the same or a parallel manner that we touched on earlier with respect to, to, to social housing. Um, I think from what you see, what, we ha what we're having at the moment is a process of evolution. So, for example, uh, the Falkirk Fund engagement with Lothian is of itself, albeit maybe relatively small scale, an innovation, but it's, it's demonstrating a willingness uh, to explore avenues. And I think perhaps over time um, and on the back of discussions such as this, um, which may well give a boost to um, exploring the, the potential um, more thoroughly. So I think it's very much work in progress might be a fair way to categorise it. Mr. White, please. <coughs> Representatives of the, each of the pension funds meet um, on a regular basis and um, as, as we've kind of touched on earlier, I think the um, collaboration on the, the overall kind of agenda for local government um, is, is certainly on the increase and um, there certainly needs to be that kind of exploration in more detail around where um, potential cross um, pension fund working can can take place. Um, I know that at the kind of director of finance levels across Scotland, that's that's also now starting to to shape up. Um, if I can take myself, I'm you know the head of finance for Aberdeen City Council, but I'm also at the present time the head of finance for Shetland Islands Council as well. So that type of collaboration is now starting to to materialise across Scotland, and I think we're. Uh, uh, an early stage of that within the, the pension funds and obviously a lot of us have got mandates that we're kind of tied into at the present time so we need to start looking at those and, and understand where there's the potential to have that kind of um, cross-sharing of expertise but I, I would have to concede that it's probably a, in its infancy at the present time. Mr McIndoe please. Yeah I, I don't think I have much to add to that Chair. I think there's been a lot of collaboration historically but it's largely taken the form of, of um, sharing ideas, sharing experience, sharing information. Uh, there are a couple of other e examples um, across the UK. So the, the administration system that most funds used is is is, is jointly um, is jointly uh, not jointly procured, but um, is jointly commissioned from its provider right across the UK. Um, and and on responsible investment, the, the local authority pension fund forum, which we have just joined as a fund. Uh, the, the majority of local government funds are members and it is quite a significant voice in lobbying companies in the UK and further afield about their standards of responsibility. Um, 
they're very much kind of spirit of the day to actually extend that to collaborative investment, but there hasn't been much of that to date. Those partnerships, I think, are just starting to be formed. Ron? Just, it's interesting, Mr. Mackendo uh, ended there on responsible investments, given that the earlier discussion convener and ethical investments, uh, then it would be, as the convener said, it would be interesting to see the, the paperwork in terms of the ethical investment strategies of the pension funds. But in terms of an earlier response was that part of the investment strategy uh, in, in terms of the mainline investment was because there was no investment vehicles there in place uh, to actually alternative investment vehicles established. Has there been any discussion, and some of these pension funds have been around for you know, three decades, whether or not there's been any discussions in terms of looking at joint work between the pension funds for investment vehicles uh, that are more akin to what would be seen as uh, social corporate responsibility in terms of investment? Mr. McIndale. Um not h historically that the, there has been um, I think only infrequent dis discussion of collective investing there, there, there are no shortage of investment routes for pension funds or investment vehicles for pension funds um, and we've all pursued our own strategies it's only I think more recently um, that, that the discussion of collective uh, investment by local authority funds has come to pass um, or, sorry has come to the fore uh, could that also involve um, a responsible investment vehicle? Yes, it depends on the definition of responsible investment. Most of our, most of the procurement of investment we do will have certain governance um, criteria. We're a very um, active promoter of living wage, um, a very vocal proponent, actually, of living wage. Um, so any vehicle we created uh, would embed those sorts of things. Um, whether it would um, be directed towards a particular type of um, ethical investment, I, I don't know. I don't think there's any plans to construct such a thing. I'm going to play devil's advocate here, which I always uh, tend to do at this committee at a point. Um, you're here today, gentlemen, um, in your roles uh, as uh, pension uh, fund uh, managers. But you're also, all three of you, heads of finance with uh, your authorities, and in Mr. White's case, two authorities. Um, and in terms of the discussions that there's been about vehicles, you know, um, the councils themselves, wearing your other hats, which you're not wearing today, could quite readily create those vehicles for um, your funds to invest in. So these discussions and things which we... Uh, we, we've heard about in early stages and all of the rest of it, you know, surely the discussions um, around some about, uh, about some of this have already been taking place at councils, which goes back to Mr Rowley's earlier point about the political will. Is the political will to do this there? Is the political will being ignored? And have you guys not got to the stage yet where although you wear your separate hats at various points, that at some point, you know, there's going to have to be an intertwining uh, to get things moving in this regard. Mr McIndoe. Well, I, I should clarify that I only wear one hat. I'm responsible Sorry, for the pension, but I'm not a director. I, I, of I beg your pardon, in your case. Um, the, is there the political will? Um, the, our investment decisions are made by our politicians, and you know, as I've said, we've invested 275 million. We have capacity to invest 775 um, million in the new opportunities portfolio as it stands. So the, the, there's a willingness there, certainly. Mr. White, I mean, as I say, we're certainly in the um, quite ad advanced stage around the, the procurement of. Um, additional housing in Aberdeen and I think once we kind of get in hopefully uh, think about the next three four months um, to a position that uh, a proposition can be made um, to the pensions committee um, once we make that proposition to the pensions committee we'll have a better understanding of what their uh, view on that investment um, is but clearly it's a committee decision um, but from what I can see I mean there's certainly the 
from what I can see, the political will is there to, to, to move these things forward as quickly as possible. Um, and, and quite clearly, we're under instruction to, to have the 1,000 houses built by 2017. So quite clearly, we need to get the vehicle in place and we need to get the investment in place. Um, and we need to do that uh, over the, the kind of next few months. Mr. Schmeel, please. Yes, convener, I think it's important to bear in mind that the pension fund is very much a separate and discrete legal entity with its own specific responsibilities. So it is very much a case of wearing two hats and one has to be wary uh, and sensitive to potential conflicts of interest. And I can give you a practical example of that in terms of our housing investment. The pension committee has made that decision. There is a local in terms of Falkirk housing dimension to that. Uh, decisions have to be made intra the council and one has to be very careful that one separates advice pertaining to the pension fund and its objectives as opposed to the particular um, imperatives that the council with its responsibility for its own housing stock has to make so it is a it's an important um, area to have regard to and to be aware of John okay uh, Willie Coffey please Thanks very much, Convener. It's a very interesting discussion we're having. Uh, I, I just want to go back to the issue about transparency uh, and the involvement and participation of local members in the decision-making that Mr Mackindo referred to there. In, in my experience, I don't think it would be particularly clear in the past exactly what the pension funds were being invested in and what companies and for what purpose. I don't recall that kind of level of detail ever been shared with elected members. I would find it difficult, convener, to to believe that local councillors or whoever would be particularly comfortable with proposals that would invest funds in arms companies or tobacco companies these days. Um, can the panel give us any examples of of whether you know, your various pensions funds have been um, prevented, say, from making investments in what folk might consider to be unethical sources and are, 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 is it happening behind the scenes and under the radar in terms of overall investment strategies and with the new regime that's coming into place and the, hopefully the new transparency that we'll see here will that be much more in the public gaze do you think will the public be able to see where these investments are going and perhaps to ask for disinvestments to take place perhaps from some of these investments so it's never been clear to me where these investments are going over the years, and I'd be interested in your views about this. I know that certain councillors are, are already unhappy and have made their views known uh, in various places. Mr White, first, please. I mean, quite transparent with, with councillors about investment decisions. You know, we, we, we set mandates for fund managers. Fund managers meet with the committee on a regular basis. Um, they discuss the investments that they've, they've they've sold investments that they've they've taken on over that period within the agreed mandate so it, it's relatively as transparent as it probably can be um, clearly those um, discussions with the fund managers are probably held um, as exempt because it's commercially sensitive information about how the fund managers are investing what their strategies are around all of that um, but how often would councillors who are making these decisions and meeting with the fund managers be told that if, a dis if disinvestment took place in certain areas that they would be failing in their fiduciary duty? Sorry, could you say that question again, please? Uh, Sorry. Uh, in terms of councillors who are meeting with fund managers, yeah. councillors who may have opinions about disinvesting in certain areas who are told... Um, that they are uh, failing in their fiduciary duties if they remove investment from, say, arms or tobacco. How often does that happen? I mean, that would be up to each individual uh, member of the committee to make that um, comment to a fund manager. So um, the, the, the fund managers um, are, are met with on a regular basis, um, and as I say, it would be up to the individual member of the committee to make that um, expression known to um, the, the fund manager. So... But if, if a member is uh, one, of, one of the greatest uh, fears, I think, that any councillor uh, could have is for a finance officer to say to them, if you do that, you'll be failing your fiduciary duty. So if a councillor who has talked about disinvestment is told <laughs> by an advisor to that panel, which may be a council officer, 
could be the fund manager, that they'd be failing in their fiduciary duty, is it likely that they would move forward in terms of trying that to, to deal with that disinvestment? I mean, that would be a decision for the individual committee um, member to make. Um, certainly, kind of my role would be to, to provide professional advice around any kind of decision that the, the committee was trying to, to move towards. Um, if you wanted to pull out of a particular investment um, and we invest elsewhere, then you would need to weigh up the, the fund investment portfolio as a whole, not just um, focus on a, a particular element. Um, so, you know, to, to some extent, it would depend on the, the disinvestment that the committee member was trying to propose um, and then how we would then kind of articulate that back into the overall investment strategy that's set. But again, the investment strategy is reviewed annually. Um, we're away to reset our investment strategy moving forward. Um, now that we've got our triennial valuation back in, um, we now have an understanding of what our kind of funding level is um, within the, the the pension fund. So again, that kind of drives the investment strategy that you'll you'll sit with. So, um, Mr. Smale. I mean, um, just by way of background, albeit as has already been outlined, the governance arrangements are, are changing. Um, but at the moment, our pension committee consists of six um, council um, members, councillors, uh, one representative from the trade unions, one representative uh, from the employers, uh, other employers, um, and one pensioners representative. So there are a range of stakeholders around the, the, the table. Um, from time to time, um, there, there is discussion, um, there may be a particular flurry in the media over a particular aspect of investment, that might be tobacco, it might be armaments, and those discussions take place. It can also take place as part of a strategic review, which one is due for us, and I think it will probably be the case for most funds in the back of the triennial valuation that's just been completed. Um, and there are other triggers, so it, it, it's something that's very much in, in the arena. But I guess, cutting to the chase, uh, there is a, a significant issue that uh, needs to be addressed around fiduciary duty, because if, if a committee, um, as trustees, and given their primary objective is to make returns for the fund to, be, to enable pensioners to be paid, if a significant divestment decision was taken, say, for ornaments, tobacco, or any of the other raft of areas that could potentially be in the frame that are held to be um, not benign products or services, um, the committee would have to be very careful that because of its fiduciary duties, it could make that call, make that decision without detriment to the returns of the fund. So I suppose in simple terms, to the extent that you could decide to disinvest from any of those areas but could find an alternative investment that gave you the same or better returns, that would allow, I think, a route to be navigated through. And the converse would equally apply if the advice was from such a decision that would risk um, diminishing the returns you could make from that investment, then the trustees would be, I would think, in an invidious position. So it's, it's very, I think we all appreciate these are very sensitive and important areas and stakeholders um, do have wide, uh, widely held and strongly held, held views on these issues, but it needs to be anchored in the primary fiduciary responsibilities of the trustees of the fund under regulations as they currently sit and case law as it currently stands. So in many cases it may well be that folks have very strongly held views but the advice that they're given is you cannot disinvest because this would be breaking your fiduciary duty. I think as my colleague said it would be for the individual trustees to make that decision. Our role would be to advise we're not the trustees. The trustees are the ones that make the decisions. I, I understand that Mr Smale. Um, Mr. McIndoe, please. Sure. Um, firstly, I, I think as a fund, we are very transparent. All of the business of the fund is, is carried out in public. All of our committee papers are publicly available. They include a, a huge amount of detail on our investment strategy, our investment structure, uh, our investment performance. Um, and that's where we try to focus, because that's largely what investment's about. It's about strategy and structure for us. 
Um, in terms of individual investments, we, um, we have about 2,600 last time I looked, individual lines of investment. Um, and uh, perhaps as many as 80 or 100 fund investments. Uh, each of those funds is making uh, numerous underlying investments. So it's, it's, it's a very long list. Uh, we, um, it's available on request. We periodically publish a full investment list. They're not very often. Um, be, because from our perspective, I think it's, it's, it's about the strategy we're pursuing rather than um, the individual investment lines. In terms of fiduciary duty, I, I think various funds, including ourselves historically, have at some point sought council's opinion on, on what fiduciary meant in, in, in respect of um, investment responsibilities for a pension fund. Um, and that has tended to um, um, s support the idea that disinvestment on the basis of, of uh, ethical considerations would be a breach of fiduciary duty. That has tended to be the advice to committees um, on the basis of council's opinion. And, and, and to date, I, I think that's still the case. That may be changing. There has, in light of a law society review last year, there has been some reinterpretation of fiduciary duty. Um, I think Dave Watson alluded to that in the, in the earlier session. Um, that reinterpretation hasn't been tested yet. Uh, however, Glasgow City Council agreed a motion just in the last few weeks um, to uh, commission a report on the possibility of disinvesting from all fossil fuels. Um, agreed the motion in the last few weeks. Um, I am in the process of working out just how to get that report, who can provide it. It's likely to include Council's opinion. In, in light of the recent reinterpretation. So we will be revisiting that um, in the course of this year. Thank you. Will I? Thanks very much for that, Commissioner, and thanks to our three colleagues for, for clarifying that particular point to, there that you made. Though, do, do you anticipate that any change to regulations might, might allow uh, pension funds to, to include this ethical element correctly and properly that might ultimately overcome this concern about the fiduciary duty of the members that serve on them? Do, are we looking at that scenario coming, do you think? Mr Smeal. I would find it difficult to imagine, um, though clearly I'm not in a position to predict the, the, the future and won't make such decisions, but my view would be I would find it difficult to believe there would be a marked change in the current scenario. I, I think, uh, consistent with what a, a lot of what we've heard today, is more of a, an evolution in stages, and uh, as Mr McIndoe touched on, um, one, one can perhaps see over a couple of decades, um, the Scargill case was, the famous Scargill case was referred to um, by Dave Watson earlier in the, the, the proceedings, from perhaps a more trenchant view then to more uh, contemporary views. And I think it becomes more nuanced, but I don't think it fundamentally, and I don't think regulations of themselves will fundamentally change that fiduciary duty and the uh, responsibility that individual trustees have uh, on listening to their advisors to, to make a, a call on it. The regulations I see as being something of a, a component in the equation or a subset. Uh, relaxation of those may more readily accommodate uh, the mechanisms by which um, social and um, infrastructure investment may be taken more fruitfully forward or more readily forward. Mr. White, please. I mean, obviously, the, 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 you know, we can put in place legislation and, and, and give guidance around all of that. I mean, I suppose fundamentally, if you were going to look to disinvest in specific elements, um, clearly we would need to understand what the impact of that would be. Um, obviously, a lot of these um, kind of areas that um, we invest in are high returning, um, high yielding investments. Um, so to preclude them from your investment strategy, we would need to understand what that would mean in terms of the kind of um, sort of more medium and longer term financial planning. Clearly, the, the onus would, would come back to the employers through um, enhanced um, contribution rates. And 
that clearly during a time of, uh, of, of difficult financial settlement um, places greater burdens back on to the, the local authority, which again impacts on frontline services. So, you know, when we kind of have to kind of wear two hats, if you like, um, I, I think Kevin kind of, uh, Mr. Stewart, sorry, earlier kind of indicated that, you know, as you try to bring the two together, there are clear um, impacts from making um, or restricting the level of types of investments that the, the, the funds could make. So from that perspective, you know, there's a there's a weighing up of that to to understand because clearly, if I'm wearing my director's of finance hat, then I'd be coming back to the Scottish government saying, if you're going to restrict the level of investments I can make here, then you'll need to increase my funding um, um, within my settlement so that I can actually afford to pay a higher contribution rate back into the fund. So it's, it's about trying to get that correct balance. So whilst I understand the kind of ethical arguments, um, it, it's, Fundamentally, the, 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 some of the strong performers and, and strong yielding investments that we have are, are in the very areas that you potentially might want to preclude. So, so tight. Mr. McIndoe, please. I, I, don't, I don't think I'm all that much to add to that. I, I struggle to see how the regulations would change to, to allow us to accept a lower investment return um, by taking other considerations. Um, uh, um, it seems a slight distraction from the focus of the fund on, on, on paying pensions. Um, clearly, uh, allowing us to do that would have knock-on consequences, pr primarily in the employer contribution rate, which is the bal balancing element in the funding equation. I think you've opened up a can of worms. Willie? Are, are those who make pension contributions, like me, <laughs> ever consulted and asked about whether I agree with the investments that are made on my behalf. I mean, surely it's the, the pension funds belong to the people that make the contributions, not, yes. the, not the fund managers. A yes or no answer, if possible, you know, please, gentlemen. Is that, is that, and is that a way to overcome this difficulty that you have if the pension people that make the contributions to the pension funds ask that we don't do this or don't do that? Surely that's enough. Mr. Smale? Uh, yes, and so far, just very briefly, in, in, in so far as um, employees are represented in the fund, and they will be more so under the new governance arrangements going forward. Yeah. Uh, Mr. White, Mr. Smell's answered the question. Okay, I, I agree yeah. with that sentence. Very, very briefly, I, thank you, Mr. Yeah, Wilson. And the Scargill case has been mentioned, and I remember Arthur Scargill challenged the fund manager. In terms of my, Mr. McIndoe's example, where Glasgow City Council have taken a decision to disinvest in fossil fuel industries as if that's the you can clarify and answer but where a local authority takes a decision is it the fund managers that make the final decision whether or not to endorse or to implement a policy of the council because councils could like the convener said have a policy to disinvest from the armaments industry but the fund managers can then override that decision. Very briefly, Mr McIndoe. The, the Council has decided to commission a report to investigate uh, disinvestment from fossil fuels. That report, the Council agreed, will go to the Strathclyde Pension Fund Committee. So it will be a pension fund decision whether to implement or not. Not the fund managers, but the actual fund the, uh, panel members will make that decision, which indeed. consists of, just for clarification, how many councillors? Eight. And how many others? Uh, none, or eight. The, the committee eight itself is the council. Okay. Uh, Claire Adamson, please. Um, uh, thank you, Convener. Um, I, I just want a little bit of clarification um, around the, um, the area of question Mr Stewart had earlier on about political will within the council where we, um, and, and how that conflicts. Because um, in, in, I think I'm quoting you correctly, Mr McIndoe say, well, it's the politicians who make the decision. But then Mr Smeal went on to say about his hats and the pension fund being a separate legal entity. Is it the case that the councillors, when they make these decisions, leave their political hats at the door and that they're acting only in the interest of the pension fund? Mr um, I think, I think, strictly speaking, um, the fiduciary responsibilities um, of the member, and I think to this extent we draw heavily on actual trustee uh, law, albeit it doesn't directly apply, but heavily colours interpretations. So they should be acting in the best interests of the, the members of the fund. 
But we live in the real world, and it's difficult uh, to imagine as human beings that one can completely divorce um, one's political hat. And I don't think that's necessarily a wrong thing, uh, but it is a difficult balancing act to, to um, manage, I would suggest. Mr White, please. My understanding is that they shouldn't be wearing a political hat whilst they're making decisions. Um, I, I can't answer for them individually whether they do that or not, but that is my understanding of what they should do. Mr McIndoe. Um, that's, that's my understanding of what they should do. That's been my experience of what they do do. That has probably become more difficult to do because I think pensions have become um, rather more politicised than they were in the past. It's more difficult, as I think Mr Smeal alluded to, to, to set that aside. But, but, but yes, they are. The, the, there is a large degree of separation between the pension fund and the rest of the council. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can I thank you very much, gentlemen, for your evidence today? Uh, I now suspend and we move into private session. Thank you. <laughs>